pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Doug Rossenow, whose work I have been following for the last 27 years, I think it was, um, when Doug, as a graduating senior, uh, took a seminar on labor history uh, that I taught in my first year uh, as an assistant professor uh, at Harvard. And ever since then, he has just been churning it out. Uh, and I have been devouring it uh, and learning uh, from every book uh, and article uh, that he has produced. He's currently a professor of history at Metropolitan State University in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, and uh, his books include uh, The Politics of Authenticity, Liberalism, Christianity, and the New Left, published in 1998. Um, he is the author of Visions of Progress, The Left Liberal Tradition in America, uh, 2007, uh, and most recently, uh, and providing the foundation for this talk, uh, The Reagan Era, A History of the 1980s, which Columbia University Press uh, produced this year in 2015. Um, these are the three books, but he has uh, many articles, uh, edited works, uh, and the like. Um, he has taught as a Fulbright Scholar uh, at the University of Oslo uh, in Norway, and he is past president of the Peace History Society. Uh, and today, uh, as Christian noted, he will be talking on the Reagan era, uh, from a new Cold War to the Washington Consensus. Doug Rosen. Well, thank you very much for that overly generous introduction, Eric. And I, and I do need to thank Eric Arneson. Do I need to yes. be close? I or, or at least grab the microphone. You can pull it out. Yes, it's that way. Wow, like Donahue. Yes. I'm not used to that. Uh, but I'll try it. Grab it. I'll try it. Is this, is this, does this work? Yeah. All right. Um, I want to thank Eric for uh, bringing me here, and all of you for coming today, and of course the National History Center. Uh, the many institutions that are involved with it and support it, George Washington University, Schaefer, and of course the Wilson Center for hosting hosting this event. So I, I thank you all for coming. I, I should say that um, this is a talk about the 1980s. So when I was preparing the talk, I went into my closet and looked for the skinniest tie that <laughs> I owned. And as you can see, it's not really that skinny, uh, which is one measure of how things change. Uh, I can only come so close to approximating the look of the 1980s, but I do have some images here that I hope will help recall uh, that era to you. And I'm sure many of you, at least, remember the era vividly. I, just through some simple arithmetic, it seems to me that we're a little behind schedule in arriving at a scholarly understanding of the 1980s as an historical period. 1980 was 35 years ago, and if you think for a moment, you realize that in 1980, 35 years prior to that was 1945, and in 1980 there was already a very substantial body of scholarship that had been amassed about the events of the mid and late 1940s, and of course there are highly specific reasons why scholars were quick to move on the events of the late 1940s. But nonetheless, I can't help but think that we're a little behind schedule when it comes to integrating the 1980s into our historical narratives. And so in the book that I've written and in the talk that I'm going to give today, I want to try to do my bit to help get us on track. And what I'm going to be talking about today is almost entirely uh, international relations, international affairs, and U.S. foreign policy from 1980 to 1990, the decade that I call the Reagan era. From a new Cold War to the Washington Consensus, both terms in quotation marks, 1980 to 1990, both of these terms, new Cold War and the Washington Consensus, became familiar terms the first one, the New Cold War, in the early 1980s, and the Washington Consensus as the 1980s gave way to the 1990s. And what I want to try to do in this talk is give some rounded, it, it will necessarily be brief, but still in some sense comprehensive picture of U.S. foreign policy as a whole in this decade between 1980 and 1990. So in a sense, I will try to trace the path from the New Cold War to the Washington Consensus. 
I'll begin by offering a, a brief overview of my presentation. First, I will talk about what people meant when they used the phrase the new Cold War, pertaining specifically to the years 1980 to 1983, which is what I think of as the heyday of, of this phrase and the in international situation that it referred to. Then I will step back actually, and talk about the decade as a whole and identify what I see as some significant features of U.S. foreign policy during the decade of the 1980s overall. Then after that, I will offer a brief narrative of events in the late 1980s, roughly between 1986 and 1990, a period uh, that I see as one that featured a crisis, but then a triumph of neoliberalism, a term that has become, I think, quite familiar to us in recent years. Then I will discuss the emerging Washington Consensus of 1989 to 1990 and what I think its meaning and significance was. First, the new Cold War. Uh, you know, I like to give this presentation and I've given it to different audiences, and when I talk to students, I offer a special prize to anybody who can tell me who this was, and I am guessing that this is not going to be a difficult task for this crowd. Show of hands, how many people know who this was? This being the left or right? The the very young, rather elegant um, method of, of taking the oath of office. Uh, so no extra credit for today's crowd. <laughs> Identifying this as Helmut Schmidt, uh, who of course was Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany, a very important ally of the United States, and I believe he became Chancellor in 1974. I'm not sure if this is him taking the oath, oath of office in 74 <coughs> or afterward. <coughs> it's an exaggeration to say that Helmut Schmidt is entirely responsible for the new Cold War but uh, I, I like to say that he had more to do with it than, than some people at least realize. The term the New Cold War, as I think a lot of people are probably aware here, referred to a newly confrontational relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union, the two great nuclear superpowers that commenced at the very end of the 1970s and stretched into the early 1980s. And opinions differed then, as I'm sure they do now, over which of the two superpowers was primarily responsible for the newly confrontational relationship, for the degradation, the decline uh, of detente, uh, the period, the uh, policy of the 1970s that had focused on uh, placing limits on the nuclear arms race and on finding areas of converging interest between the two great superpowers and on the lessening of tension, which is literally what the term detente means, the shift away from detente toward a newly aggressive stance by the United States with regard to the Soviet Union, a stance that was certainly championed by uh, Ronald Reagan, but I don't think was begun by Ronald Reagan. Uh, <coughs> one of the signal issues of the so-called New Cold War of the early 1980s were the so-called Euro missiles, the new generation of nuclear-armed missiles that the United States delivered to uh, West Germany and other NATO allies in 1983. And uh, this was highly controversial, as I will discuss in the early 1980s. At, but I think that some people today forget, or perhaps have never understood, that when <coughs> President Reagan, Ronald Reagan, uh, delivered these missiles to Western Europe, he was following through on a commitment that his Democratic predecessor, President Jimmy Carter, had made. And that Carter had made at least to a degree, at the urging of Helmut Schmidt, who was, of course, not only the Chancellor of West Germany, but the Social Democratic Chancellor of West Germany. And the real significance of this, I think, is to bring home to us, or to remind to us, uh, remind us, that I think it should, that the idea of the United States and its alliance partners taking a newly assertive stance toward the Soviets at the end of the 1970s, at the beginning of the 1980s, was a very broadly shared view among political elites in the United States and in its allies. As I say, there was certainly opposition, substantial opposition, even elite opposition, to this newly assertive stance, but it had broad and bipartisan support. 
at the end of the 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s. Now, Reagan specifically took uh, a view that did, I think, put him uh, <coughs> apart from Carter uh, and many other <coughs> political leaders and strategic thinkers in the United States and its allies, which was his view that the Soviets had opened a window of strategic superiority or a window of vulnerability from the perspective of the United States. At the end of the 1970s, Reagan said this quite often, and he maintained this view into the early years of his presidency in 1982. Uh, he stated publicly that he believed the Soviets had, at that time, a definite margin of <coughs> superiority. Reagan's view, I think, of the Cold War up until that time was that either the Soviets or the United States would have a position of strategic superiority, and that whichever great power, whichever superpower had that superior position, it would be able to leverage that position into uh, political, diplomatic, and strategic victories the, across the spectrum, uh, you know, geographically and in terms of different strategic interactions. Reagan's view was that nuclear weapons were not going to be used <clears throat> probably, but that the threat that they might be used by the power that had strategic superiority would make the other power back down. The other power would, be, would become tractable in political conflicts around the world. Reagan's view was that the Soviets had got this position of superiority and he wanted it back for the United States, thus the very large, uh, really rather massive military buildup that Reagan supported uh, as President Carter had initiated and had pledged a significant increasing <coughs> military buildup as well, but Reagan thought it was very important to exceed what Carter <coughs> had pledged. There was an adverse public reaction in the United States and elsewhere to the, uh, the policies of the Reagan administration. There was plenty of support for those policies, but Reagan's uh, rhetorically more belligerent or harsh stance toward the Soviets did excite opposition in a way that Carter's embrace of the new Cold War at the end of his administration had not. And I think that there was some bad faith involved here. Um, after all, the SPD in West Germany, after they fell from power in 1982, then decided that they thought the Euro missiles were really terrible and that Reagan was trying to force them down Europe's throat, which I think was not a complete view of, of reality. But as a result of Reagan being the one uh, who was in office, the missiles started to look different, uh, partly because Reagan and his administration showed little interest in pursuing arms control diplomacy at the same time, which was supposed to be the other half of the so-called dual track uh, involved in the delivery of the new missiles to Western Europe. But there were also a series of rash statements on the part of high officials in the Reagan administration, which led some people to fear that the world was coming close to the brink of really unthinkable destruction and nuclear war. This is a picture of what is still the largest political demonstration in the United States history. Uh, the demonstration in New York City in 1983 in favor of what was known as the nuclear freeze, which was the idea that both superpowers should embrace a bilateral halt to the deployment of new nuclear weapons. Uh, there was widespread protest, and Reagan and other political leaders eventually uh, took note, as I'll explain. There was uh, a widespread fear, as I say, in late 1983 that the world was getting close to the edge of the precipice. And there were many different signs and symbols of this, uh, but this is a, a still shot from one notable event in 1983. This is from the television movie The Day After, which aired on ABC television, and I think it was October 83. And has, has anybody seen this? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it showed it, for those who don't know, uh, it, it was a dramatic portrayal of an actual <coughs> between the United States and the Soviet Union from the perspective of one community, Lawrence Kansas, I believe. And here you see the amazing 
uh, image, I found it amazing when I saw it as a young person, actually seeing the missiles launched from their silos on the prairie. And of course, the American Middle West uh, is where many of the uh, American ICBMs were, were housed. And this uh, was one of many uh, indications of the sense of foreboding and alarm that had become palpable by 1983. Uh, and as I'll explain, the brinkmanship of the new Cold War did ebb eventually, and, and to some extent because Reagan took note of uh, public opposition to his policy facing a re-election campaign in 1984. I, I'll, I'll get into that, but I want to pause here now, having talked about the new Cold War and the environment of the early 1980s, to give some broader sense of what I see as some important, not the only important, but certainly significant and outstanding features of U.S. foreign policy during the decade of the 1980s as a whole. I'm going to list them here, and then I'll talk about each one in turn. First, a faith in arms, a faith that armaments would be um, an effective and successful instrument uh, of policy in, in a number of different respects, actually. Second, counterinsurgency, uh, a term that's become newly familiar to a lot of people in the years since 9-11 with regard to the U.S. Uh, embroilments in Iraq and Afghanistan, but one that uh, was very much present as a feature of U.S. policy in the 1980s uh, with some enthusiasm from within the Reagan administration and the basic idea of counterinsurgency is that uh, one is trying to defeat an armed rebellion either within one's own country or within uh, an ally's borders. I, I don't, I, I could talk for a long time about counterinsurgency, but one of the notable features of it, as I think many people here probably are aware, is that sometimes it's very clear that there's an established government and a, a rebellion or an insurgency against it. In other situations, there's a, a more evenly divided civil conflict uh, with <clears throat> perhaps two serious claimants to governmental legitimacy, and part of the game in counterinsurgency is affixing the label of the government to one side and of insurgency to the other side in a civil conflict, and that was part of the counterinsurgency policy pursued by the United States in the 1980s. A third feature was insurgency, and this in a, certain, in a sense was uh, more widespread and more notable as a feature of U.S. policy in the 1980s, partly because of where it was attempted. Uh, I'll explain in, in a few moments, but also because of the way that the policy of insurgency, rather than counterinsurgency, echoed and seemed to embody a traditional conservative Republican call in the context of U.S. foreign policy during the Cold War for rollback. This is an idea that went back to the 1950s, the idea that the United States should seek to roll back existing revolutionary or socialist Governments should try to undo them. And of course, the term that we use today is regime change. The idea in the policy of insurgency was that rather than counterinsurgency, where one is trying to uh, bolster uh, an allied government that is facing a rebellion in the context of the insurgent policy, the United States in the 1980s fueled, funded, and supported very strongly efforts to overthrow certain governments uh, around the world. The fourth feature of U.S. foreign policy in the Reagan era is, I would say, a disregard for law. Now, I did think about how to put this a bit more gently, um, tactfully, and I, I, I'm certainly <coughs> open to suggestion about this, but I couldn't really come up with a better way to put it. And I don't necessarily mean by this that there was always a, um, an aggressive uh, proclivity for law-breaking in the realm of foreign policy, although there were instances, some of them well-known, where that did occur. I, I'm referring somewhat more broadly to the, the view and the attitude that the law was an annoyance, an obstacle to be got around. Uh, and this is not only a reference to international law, although that was certainly the view of international law by the U.S. government in the 1980s, I think, but also sometimes uh, with regard to U.S. law, to the U.S. code. And, and, and again, some examples are quite well known, uh, and I can touch on them later on. 
Fifth, a sensitivity to public opinion. There were definite red lines. There were limits to the policies that the U.S. government would pursue internationally. This was very much the case under President Reagan, and uh, I'll, I'll explain. And six, what I would describe as tactical instability. There were certain areas of policy in particular where US, uh, the U.S. government zigged and zagged and zigged again in the 1980s, trying to find an effective and coherent uh, policy, not succeeding very well. Sometimes this tactical instability was a matter of the U.S. government at one time being internally divided and actually pursuing simultaneous and opposed policies in some areas. This did happen sometimes. There's been a good deal of talk recently about the idea of uh, the triumph of improvisation, as a title of a recent very fine book uh, puts it, uh, with regard specifically to superpower negotiations as they resumed between President Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev after he became the leader of the Soviet Union in 1985. And, and I think that there was a good deal to that idea, the triumph of improvisation, specifically in that relationship. In a certain sense, the improvisational quality of uh, U.S. farm policy in the 1980s is sort of the flip side of what I described as the tactical instability. There were some areas of policy where the United States just was trying and trying to find a consistent and coherent policy and had difficulty doing so. So, now I want to touch on each of these six features, at least briefly. I'll try to keep this within <coughs> reasonable limits. You can tell me if I'm not. Uh, first, the faith in arms. There were different ways in which this was true. This is, I think, an image actually from the National Air and Space Museum, yes. very nearby one of the Pershing II missiles that the United States deployed in, um, in Western Europe in 1983. And I mentioned earlier what Reagan's view of the significance and, and value of this kind of weaponry was. It wasn't, even though some people thought this, it wasn't that Reagan thought that the United States could use these nuclear weapons. It was, he thought, that by regaining what he thought was a lost American strategic edge, the United States would be able to leverage that superiority and, and, and have its way in various points of conflict around the world, rather than the Soviet Union doing so. So he saw, uh, it wasn't exactly a deterrence argument. It instead was an argument for the strategic uh, kind of domino effect, I don't think that's a bad term, but uh, the, the ripple effect that strategic superiority would have even in you know, conventional, theaters of conventional conflict as well as diplomatic conflict. There was a lot of talk in the conservative movement that Reagan was part of for a long time before he became president that the Soviet Union could win the Cold War without firing a shot. This is a term that was frequently invoked without firing a shot. The idea was they would realize and the United States would realize that the Soviets had strategic superiority and for fear that the Soviets might act on that by launching the first strike, the United States would need to back down in confidence. And I think Reagan's idea was that he wanted the situation to be the other way around. So he believed that nuclear weapons had great efficacy as uh, an instrument of U.S. policy in this way. But of course there were other more conventional ways in which uh, Reagan and other U.S. political leaders in the 1980s thought that use of military force would be helpful and effective. This is an image uh, from the U.S. invasion of Grenada in 1983, a small island nation in the Caribbean near the South American coast, which was ruled by a socialist junta and Reagan launched an invasion in 1983 and, not surprisingly, succeeded in overturning the existing government. And so this was uh, a realization of the conservative Republican uh, vision of rollback. It worked, not surprisingly. Again, I do remember, I, I'll pause briefly to say something at a more personal level. I remember as a young person uh, in the early 1980s, I was in high school, um, finding all of this quite persuasive, both Reagan's idea that building up uh, American weaponry, including strategic weaponry, would put the United States in an advantageous uh, position, uh, partly because if there were <coughs> arms control negotiations, the United States would be able to bargain from a position of strength, but also that 
that there would be efficacy in simply establishing U.S. strategic superiority, but also the invasion of Grenada I shared, certainly as a young person, in the widespread enthusiasm for, for this undertaking in the United States. Uh, it seemed to me at the time that this would have salutary effects, not just in the Western Hemisphere, but perhaps elsewhere as well. And so I, I well understood the view that it seems to me was present within U.S. policy. Uh, no more Vietnams now, Grenadas. Faith in arms also in the area of counterterrorism. This is an image from 1986 of Navy jet fighters on board an aircraft carrier in the Mediterranean Sea uh, as part of the intensive airstrikes that President Reagan ordered against uh, Muammar Gaddafi and the Libyan regime in that year, 1986, airstrikes in the vicinities of Tripoli and Benghazi. The idea, and this was the uh, innovation of the Reagan era in terms of U.S. counterterrorism policy. Terrorism had been perceived as a very serious and mounting problem by Americans and many others in the 1970s and this extended into the 1980s with airline hijackings, bombings of civilian targets, soft targets around the world and, and other events. The idea, the controlling idea of counterterrorism policy, to the extent there was one for the United States in the Reagan era, was that there were state sponsors of non-state terrorist groups, and that the way to cut the head off the snake was to go after the rogue states who were sponsoring terrorism. And this is an idea that I think is, is quite familiar to us from more recent events, but it was very much present in the 1980s when, of course, the United States government declared the first war on terrorism. And the term was first used by U.S. officials, I think, in 1984. But it was a term that was much used in conversations about U.S. policy at the time. And this, of course, was the, the, the foremost example of striking at what the United States believed was a state sponsor of terrorism. So it, clearly a, a strong belief in the efficacy of arms as an instrument of counterterrorism policy. Moving on to counterinsurgency. The main showcase of U.S. counterinsurgency policy in the 1980s was El Salvador. There were other lesser examples of it. Guatemala, where the U.S. involvement was substantial but not as extensive. Uh, also, Namibia, or Southwest Africa, as it was sometimes still called at that time, where uh, the South African Defense Forces were waging their own counterinsurgency campaign. Uh, the Reagan administration was somewhat divided about that, so there was enthusiasm about some other counterinsurgency efforts, at least among some uh, conservatives in the 1980s, but El Salvador was the big show where uh, a regime allied with the United States was facing a very significant military insurgency uh, led by the FMLN, and the United States, uh, under President Reagan and then George H.W. Bush afterwards, uh, extensively supported uh, and uh, armed uh, Salvadoran military and security forces who were waging war against the FMLN. This is a, a, an image of, from later years, the excavation site of a, a large massacre in and around the village of El Mozote uh, in El Salvador. Massacres that occurred in 1981 at the hands of Salvadoran army battalion that had been trained by the United States and killed between 500 and 800 people. Uh, so counterinsurgency then, as I think ever, uh, tends to be uh, a rather atrocious business. It, some might disagree, but I think it has that tendency, and certainly this was the case in uh, El Salvador. I, I point out that um, the revelation of this massacre in 1982 caused controversy in the United States, but did not knock U.S. policy off course. U.S. support for the counterinsurgency effort continued strongly. Onto insurgency, which was again the rollback policy, uh, somewhat more widely practiced, at least in a couple of different environments, most dramatically and perhaps most strikingly in Afghanistan, because this was a way of waging indirect warfare against the Soviets themselves, against the Red Army, which had invaded Afghanistan in 1979, was waging their own counterinsurgency effort there in an effort to prop up their client regime in Kabul. And of course this led the United States along with Pakistan and the Saudis to 
uh, fund and equip the Wichita <coughs> rebels. And here they are, a very famous uh, photograph posing on, a, on top of a down Soviet helicopter. Uh, so this was, uh, again, uh, not just a striking example of the policy of insurgency or rollback, but it was one that enjoyed very broad political support across party lines uh, in the United States. The other really well-known uh, place where the United States pursued policy of insurgency and uh, an effort at regime change was in Nicaragua, which eventually became a somewhat notorious effort. This is, uh, a, you know, in very sharp contrast to the situation in El Salvador, where the United States was supporting the government in trying to repress an insurgency. In Nicaragua, the United States was army funding uh, and strongly supporting the insurgency known as the Contras. Uh, and here is uh, President Reagan in the Oval Office with men on the left, the white haired gent is Adolfo Calero, one of the main uh, political leaders of the Contra forces. And in the background, as I think a lot of people will realize, is Oliver North uh, in Mufti, uh, as he usually was dressed when he worked for the National Security, Security Council staff uh, in the Reagan administration, where he was tasked with coordinating. U.S. ties to and U.S. support for the Contras at a time when such support in any material sense had been outlawed by the U.S. Congress and this of course is what led to uh, what became known as the Iran-Contra scandal or at least the Contra part of it. Now, I said that I think there was a disregard for the law manifested in U.S. policy in the 1980s, basically the idea that the law was a hindrance and annoyance and something to be dealt with rather than simply obey. And there were numerous areas in which this seemed to be the case. In Nicaragua, uh, the United States was uh, found to be waging a covert war against the ruling Sandinista regime by the uh, International Court of Justice, which the U.S. government did not take very seriously. Uh, but I, I would focus really on the issue of U.S. law. I've already mentioned the congressional uh, prohibition placed on U.S. aid to the Contras in 1985 and 86, basically. Uh, but also the issue of the favorite hostages led President Reagan in particular to feel that the law was not and could not be his uppermost concern. And the quotation I have here is, is from a, a meeting in the National Security Council. When President, President Reagan said, the Beirut hostages, in the, there was a terrible condition of civil war in Lebanon, and there were many uh, particularly Shia Muslim militant groups who kidnapped uh, a series of American and other Western uh, persons held them hostage in Lebanon. And this became a big political issue in the United States and became one that Reagan personally felt a lot of pressure about in the mid-1980s, and he felt that he needed to try to do something about it. And he said in, in one meeting, uh, look, I can explain to the American public if it should come to light that I've broken a law to try to get these hostages released. That will be easier to explain to the American people, he said, than the idea that big, strong President Reagan couldn't do anything to try to get these hostages released. And this is how he <coughs> described himself as me, big, strong President Reagan. And I think he was referring to his public image, which he was very conscious of. And there were, the reason the law uh, arose as an issue in part was because uh, the main strategy that the United States devised for trying to get these hostages released was to secretly sell arms to the Iranian regime in the hope that the Iranians would use their good offices with their fellow Shia in Lebanon to get some of these hostages released. And, and Iran was labeled by the United States in public as a terrorist organization, black for bad in U.S. arms to be sold to Iran. There was a, a big legal problem with doing this, but Reagan said, that is not going to be my foremost concern. In the middle there is William Buckley, 
not the famous one of National Review. The other, William Buckley, who was CIA station chief, who was one of the Beard hostages kidnapped in, in, in terms of U.S. intelligence, uh, obviously the most important hostage. Uh, the president really wanted to get him out, and they failed to do so. He died in the hands of his captors, having been tortured and maltreated. On the right is uh, Robert McFarlane, who's national security advisor to President Reagan during some of this period, and who here is probably testifying before Congress after the story all came out about uh, a trip that he and Oliver North made to Tehran, a quite bizarre trip in which they, they tried to deliver some weapons to, uh, to the Iranians in exchange for supposedly helping to get hostages released. Uh, this is William Casey, who is uh, Reagan's director of central intelligence for most of uh, Reagan's presidency. And yeah, this is how Casey referred to uh, the Congress, those assholes on the Hill. Um, so he, he took his reporting responsibilities to the House and Senate Intelligence Committees rather lightly, which eventually got him into trouble with the Senate Intelligence Committee. But nonetheless, I don't think things changed that much. Uh, the CIA and other intelligence agencies continue to conceal covert operations uh, abroad from uh, members of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. Uh, with whom they were statutorily uh, obliged uh, to, to share such information. Enough said. The Contras, uh, as I, I said earlier, during, uh, it was actually not that long a period when U.S. government aid to the Contras was forbidden by U.S. law. It was only about 18 months, but, you know, Actions of the Reagan administration during those 18 months came back to, uh, to haunt them. Body and soul, Oliver North felt that he had been told that his job, Bud McFarland said this as well, was during this period when the so-called Second Boland Amendment was enforced. This is what uh, forbade U.S. government agencies from giving any support to the Contras. During this period, North and McFarland felt it was their responsibility to keep the Contras alive, body and soul. And, and this, meant, this meant finding a way around the law, finding uh, basically um, finding a way to fund the Contras by taking profits from the secret and also illegal Iranian arms sales, but all and, and funneling them to the Contras, but also by setting up a kind of shadow CIA, mainly comprised of former retired uh, CIA uh, officials who could uh, do the things that the CIA was forbidden by law from doing during this period. Moving on from the question of law to uh, the, the fifth feature of U.S. policy that I wanted to mention, sensitivity to public opinion. There really were limits to what the U.S. government was willing to do. Uh, there, was, there was a limit to where and how they would wage direct warfare. Yes, in Grenada, the United States was willing, Reagan was willing to order direct U.S. force. Other than that, the use of direct U.S. force by the uniformed military was something that was sharply limited. Uh, certainly when Reagan was president, and in El Salvador, as well as in Nicaragua, uh, the policies were really designed around <coughs> avoiding the involvement of U.S. military personnel in fighting. And this was very much a reflection of U.S. public opinion, which was never very strongly supportive of the policies of insurgency and counterinsurgency in Central America. It's important to understand this. There was a lot of support for these policies uh, in Washington, uh, on Capitol Hill, as well as in the executive branch, but they were not terribly popular with the American public at large. And so I think Reagan and his top aides understood this and understood that this meant they could only take things so far. Most dramatically, the sensitivity to public opinion, I think, was illustrated and manifested in superpower relations. With Reagan again facing re-election in 1984, and with rising public opposition to what his critics called his belligerency and brinkmanship, Reagan did start to change his rhetoric rather markedly. Starting in 1983, he began to say that uh, a nuclear war could never be won and must never be fought. He'd never said this. And as far as I know, he had never really thought this before 1982 or 1983, but he started to say this pretty regularly. <coughs> and once there was uh, 
uh, a leader like Gorbachev in power in the Soviet Union starting in 1985, things really started to move in retrospect quite quickly. But Reagan did say uh, at one point that you know he had wanted to engage his Soviet counterpart in uh, arms control or arms reduction ne negotiations, but they kept dying on him. You know, on drop off <laughs> Brezhnev and on drop off and Chernyakko. That was really less than honest on Reagan's part because during his first term, he, he showed little interest in such negotiations. But that changed as his re-election campaign approached. And in 1984, he made a speech to the United Nations General Assembly in which he really extended his hand to the Soviets uh, and said, I'm ready to commence serious negotiation. And then again, once Gorbachev uh, was in power, he suddenly started uh, fielding uh, proposals to eliminate all nuclear weapons by the year 2000. And eventually, Reagan decided that he could not, not accept Gorbachev's bear hug. Uh, the first meeting, the, the first summit between them in 1985 in Geneva is the image on the left. The two leaders didn't agree to anything uh, concrete there, but they did actually agree to something that I think was significant rhetorically and politically. They agreed on a joint statement issued at the end of the meeting in which they both said neither superpower was pursuing or would pursue nuclear superiority over the other. And this was a significant shift for Reagan, who had always said before that that one party or the other had to be superior. You know, the idea of strategic parity was something very much associated with the policies of detente, and it was something that Reagan and other conservatives had always rejected, the idea of strategic parity. And now Reagan embraced it without using that term, and certainly without using the word detente, which was you know, forbidden uh, within his administration. But it was significant, and eventually uh, the two leaders signed the Treaty of Energy Arranged Nuclear Forces. They're signing it here in the image on the right in uh, Washington, D.C. in 1987. Didn't dismantle that many nuclear weapons, but it was still highly significant. It was the first agreement between the superpowers that ever involved or required them to dismantle any nuclear weapons. And the other thing that's so important to understand about it from the U.S. point of view is that it required the Soviets to dismantle a lot more than America did. I mean, basically, Reagan was already changing his tune in 1983, 1984, but Gorbachev, when he took power, was offering terms that were so favorable to the United States that uh, it was impossible, I think, for Reagan, and probably would have been impossible for any American president to resist them for very long. Uh, but it certainly was with uh, sensitivity toward the opinion of humankind in the United States and elsewhere, among other factors, that Reagan moved toward what I think is a return to detente. Now, moving on to the issue of tactical <coughs> instability. Let me do it. Ten more. Ten more? Okay. Um, there were certain areas of policy where I see this tactical instability as particularly prominent, none more so than counterterrorism. I discussed earlier the Reaganite view that the way to deal with terrorism was to strike at rogue states that were fueling, supporting, subventing terrorism. Most prominently identified as a state-sponsored terrorism in the 1980s by the United States was Gaddafi, ruled by Muammar Gaddafi, you see on the right. But more generally, there was a strong perception in the United States that terrorism emanated from the Middle East, uh, and U.S. policy toward the Middle East was very much entangled with counterterrorism policy, but I think not in a very coherent, effective, or successful way. On the left is the terrible image in the aftermath of the bombing, the truck bombing of the U.S. Marine barracks in, uh, were outside Lebanon in 1983, in which 241 U.S. Marines were killed. Of course, it's a sign of changing times. Um, that back then, that was considered an enormous number of deaths for the U.S. military to absorb 241, so many that people really remembered the number. They had been sent there as part of a multinational force attempting to bring order and buy time for the Lebanese government to restore order in a situation of civil conflict. They were bombed, many of them killed, and after a decent interval had passed, Reagan withdrew uh, the Marines. He didn't stick with his policy, it didn't seem to be going very well. So the Reagan administration moved from one uh, approach to another. Uh, they excoriated the Iranian regime as a sponsor of terrorism, particularly by Shia Muslim groups in public, while at the same time 
secretly provisioning them with weapons for use in their war against Iraq. The United States' uh, overt policy toward the Iran Iraq war was to support Iraq, uh, ruled by Saddam Hussein, and provided uh, the Iraqis with a variety of, uh, of means of assistance. In the center, in 1986, you see Reagan and the First Lady, Nancy Reagan, greeting David Jacobson, who's one of the American hostages in Beirut, who was released seemingly due to, as a result of, the weapons sales to Iran. There was at least, there was no net gain of American hostages released. Uh, for each one who was released, another was taken. Nonetheless, uh, Jacobson was released, uh, and he'd been horribly treated, tortured by his captors, and Reagan was quite convinced that he was pursuing the right policy at that time, um, because it seemed to be bearing fruit, at least at that moment. But uh, I see a, a great deal of incoherence, inconsistency, and a marked lack of success in U.S. counterterrorism policy in the 1980s. The airstrikes against Gaddafi did not clearly work. Uh, in fact, two years after those airstrikes in 1981, uh, agents of the Libyan government struck back at the United States uh, by blowing up Pan 103 uh, over Lockerbie, Scotland, killing a great many Americans as well as others. As far as Lebanon was concerned, the groups that had been targeted as the agents of terrorism there, such as Hezbollah, only grew in power during the course of this period and afterwards. So it was very difficult for uh, U.S. policy makers to find uh, an effective counterterrorism policy, and they seem to be working across purposes uh, if you view the period as a whole. I think there was also tactical instability around the issue of democratization. You see here Corazon Aquino, uh, who uh, displaced Ferdinand Marcos, long uh, U.S. ally in the Philippines uh, in uh, the late 1980s. The, this was a case in which the U.S. government, rather than simply lurching from one policy to a sharply conflicting policy, was internally divided, basically pursuing two opposed policies at the same time. There was one that read one. Reagan as president had one policy, and basically the rest of his foreign policy team had another policy. Reagan wanted to stick with Marcos. He felt personally attached to Marcos, didn't um, think Aquino was preferable, and most of his foreign policy advisors, led by Secretary of State George Schultz, wanted Marcos gone thinking that he was a liability, and thought that Aquino would be really an upgrade from the U.S. point of view. Uh, so there was a good deal of incoherence and chaos, including some scenes that were almost comic in, in U.S. policy toward the Philippines. Okay. Now moving on, uh, I've talked about uh, the New Cold War in the early 1980s and about the broad features of U.S. policy during the Reagan era in general. Now I want to talk about the events of the late 1980s. When events started to move quickly in international affairs, uh, and from the U.S. point of view, from the perspective of those in charge in Washington, uh, in some areas of policy, great success was achieved. In others, there was a disgrace, a scandal, and failure. I want to pause to talk briefly about the relationship between foreign policy and domestic policy and politics, because I think there was a relationship that is not always highlighted. In the late 1980s, particularly between 1986 and 1988, uh, what I would call Reaganism, which is basically the doctrine of small government at home and muscular foreign policy abroad, was in trouble. It was in trouble in terms of foreign policy because of the Iran-Contra scandal, which was breaking at this time, even as Reagan was achieving great success in superpower dialogue. But also, the Reaganite doctrine of neoliberalism at home was coming under increasingly severe attack. Uh, there was a rising force of critics in the United States uh, on the left, there's an image of homelessness, which was sharply escalating in the 1980s. And on the right is, is an image from uh, AIDS activists that they, they circulated in the late 1980s, clearly targeting Reagan quite personally as somebody who was responsible for deaths from AIDS because you know, Reagan did not want to deal with the HIV AIDS crisis. It made him very uncomfortable and he just didn't deal with it. Um, and so these were basically areas where the doctrine of small government came under quite effective Criticism, and there was a rising tide of 
a clamor for government activism in areas like homelessness and HIV AIDS, as well as a rising economic populism, uh, feeling that the economic expansion that had been ongoing since 1982 had not been, um, had not lifted all boats, and that areas of the country that had undergone severe deindustrialization and job losses in the early 1980s had not recovered, and that things could not just be left to the market economically. This was a rising sentiment in the United States in the years between 1986 and 1988. Uh, and this ball was basically handed to Reagan's vice president, George H.W. Bush, the first president, George Bush, who wanted to run uh, for president in 1988, and who did, and who won. He confronted a difficult political environment, actually, for somebody who had been Reagan's vice president and who was also a somewhat conservative Republican, because on, on a variety of policy fronts, the Reaganite uh, doctrines were under attack and were increasingly perceived as inadequate. Bush ended up dealing with this political difficulty rather deftly by changing the subject, uh, by waging a presidential campaign that focused on violent crime, uh, to a lesser extent on, on the issue of patriotism and saluting the flag. Uh, this picture obviously much indicates uh, Willie Horton, a violent felon, uh, who became a, a central character in the drama of the 1988 presidential campaign. Uh, Bush used the issue of violent crime first and foremost to successfully turn back the challenge from the Democratic nominee that year, Michael Dukakis uh, of Massachusetts. So what Bush did, I think very importantly, was to get American conservatism through a rough patch and keep it in power, uh, at least in the executive branch, so that, uh, that conservatives could go on to fight another day, perhaps on more propitious terrain. So understand, Bush did not, I think, uh, win election by defending neoliberal doctrines. He, he, he won by, by changing the subject to something else. Of course, once Bush became uh, president, the strategic situation in the world was rather different. The Soviet Union was basically getting out of the superpower business. The United States no longer needed to consider very seriously how the Soviets would respond when they designed U.S. foreign policy, which U.S. leaders had had to consider very seriously for 40 years. And Bush made this very, very clear by becoming more of a warrior president, really, than Reagan had been, uh, showing a greater willingness than Reagan had to wage direct warfare in 1989. Uh, invading Panama, and then in 1991, uh, marshaling a very large international coalition, including uh, 400, some 400,000 U.S. Uh, troops, to repulse occupying Iraqi forces from Kuwait in the first uh, Gulf War. Here, of course, you see Bush and uh, General Schwarzkopf, H. Norman Schwarzkopf, uh, visiting troops in the Saudi desert prior to the push into Kuwait. There was clearly a new lack of inhibition on the part of the United States uh, in terms of deploying and using direct military force with the waning of the Cold War. Now, I need to make clear, I'm not saying that these instances uh, of direct US warfare had behind them some uh, specifically neoliberal design or, or intention. Uh, they, they weren't designed to create some kind of free market utopias in Panama or, or Kuwait. That was not the idea. Um, but the new lack of military ambition on the part of the United States was a very important uh, factor and facet of this moment when neoliberalism was in crisis domestically in the United States and in the new environment of US strategic predominance, the Washington Consensus emerged. The Washington Consensus basically referred to the idea of economic policy prescriptions, first directed at sovereign states in Latin America, but then extended to other regions of the world, <coughs> South Asia, East Asia, basically neoliberal policy prescriptions. The idea that more free market policies would be to the benefit of developing nations, most specifically the idea of trade liberalization, lowering tariff <coughs> barriers, uh, creating fields for open investment, uh, also advocacy of fiscal restraint in terms of social welfare spending. The Washington Consensus did not necessarily 
involve uh, the full-on prescription for so-called structural adjustment policies that some critics charged, but it was still basically a neoliberal uh, policy agenda pushed out, exported abroad at precisely the time when neoliberalism was faced with a rising chorus of critics domestically in the United States. And the idea, of course, uh, of the Washington Consensus was that uh, international uh, financial agencies housed in the United States, the IMF and the World Bank specifically, would use their leverage uh, revolving around debt to push or export this neoliberal vision to other sovereign states. The other thing that is so important about understanding the Washington Consensus, you need to understand the importance of the Washington part and the consensus part. The Washington part was that it was supposedly emanating, first and foremost, from institutions in Washington, but the consensus part denoted the very broad support among American political elites, U.S. political elites, for this policy prescription. Here, Bush, and then Bill Clinton, who of course was Democratic president, who ousted Bush and became president in 1993, but it became palpably clear after Clinton became president that the so-called Washington Consensus was a very broad bipartisan consensus. Uh, and it's essential to understand this. Now, I'll just close by noting what I've already suggested. The, to me, fascinating and important point that neoliberalism was being exported abroad from the United States quite forcefully and with new force precisely at the time when neoliberal economic policies were increasingly questioned and criticized inside the United States. And this points up what I see as a, a real interconnection between the realms of domestic politics and policy and international affairs connections that are not always explored uh, or <coughs> scrutinized as seriously as they might be, but it seems to me that this is an important connection to consider when we think about how the 1980s gave way to the 1990s and how the so-called Washington Consensus emerged. And I'll simply close by saying when we start to talk about the Washington Consensus in the early 1990s, in particular, at that point, 1980 starts to seem like a really long time ago. And it certainly does to me. Thank you. It's very interesting to talk, but you can only cover so much, but you did not say a word about the Falklands War, which left the Reagan administration scratching its head as to whether to support the UK or a group of Argentine thugs, uh, who uh, were acting according to their own vision of neoliberalism. And also, it was a kind of doctrine of no enemies on the right. So as long as the country supported the US in the Cold War, like Pinochet or um, apartheid in South Africa, nary a word of condemnation, because they were on our side. And you only get um, a consistent view of human rights when um, Bush becomes president, or when you have something so egregious like the invasion of, of seizure of Kuwait by Iraq, which probably, arguably, Reagan would have responded to in the same way. Yeah, it's quite possible about that Kuwait of Reagan being president, although I don't know. I don't know. Because Reagan did have, um, um, you know, maybe his inhibition would have been thrown off as well with the end of the Cold War. That's a what might have been. Regarding the Falklands, this is very interesting. I mean, especially the comparison to South Africa, because South Africa is a case where the, uh, the United States in the 80s did seem to pursue, at least under Reagan, a no enemies to the right policy. That changed, actually, when, when Bush became president. But, you see, this is an indication of the tactical instability, some people would call it flexibility, I suppose, in U.S. policy, because I don't think that was the policy toward Argentina. I mean, U.S. policy toward the Falklands was internally divided. You know, some high foreign policy officials wanted to support the Argentines, and, and others wanted to support the British, and, and Reagan came down on the side of, of uh, Margaret Thatcher, and, and the British, so they didn't support the Argentine junta, and, and I think the generals in Buenos Aires were rather surprised. Um, they thought that they could count on the United States for some support, particularly because you know, they were partners in counterinsurgency campaigns in, uh, in Latin America, so I, I think you know, here there is some, I mean, some people might see it as uh, admirable pragmatism, and I see it as, as further evidence of, uh, of, of incoherence.
might not be able to cover everything in a book, uh, in a talk, but in the book there are at least a couple of pages devoted to this, right next to you. Uh, Will Amatruda, if I may comment on the previous comment, uh, I think a change began before uh, Bush 41 became president in that uh, Reagan's veto of South Africa <coughs> sanctions was overridden uh, by a two-thirds vote in the, in, in the Senate in 1986, and one of the leaders was uh, uh, Nancy Landon uh, Kassebaum. Yeah, very importantly. Uh, the Southern Africa policy was a, was a complete wreck. For, it was a total bust for the Reagan administration. They had to retreat on all fronts, uh, you know, because their clients in South Africa were failing uh, in their various wars within the region, and also because of you know, the very strong uh, dissent registered within Congress. And, and this was a, a stinging defeat for Reagan. Uh, and if you were to, say, do a balance sheet or a score sheet of U.S. foreign policy in different theaters of the world, you know, Bush 41 tried to salvage something in Southern Africa, basically, because he saw that the policy the U.S. had pursued for eight years under Reagan was a total wreck. It failed in every measure of the way. Straight in the far back, and then we'll move our way around the table. Um, Bob Hathaway, thanks for a really interesting presentation. It's a little bit difficult to wrap my mind around the fact that 1980 is as close to 1945 <laughs> as it is today. Um, I want to ask you um, a question about really how you started uh, your presentation by noting that scholarly treatment of Reagan was behind schedule, as you put it. Um, why? Um, Reagan was, by all measures, a consequential president, no matter what you thought of him. Um, and so, other than perhaps lack of archival material, it really is. Uh, Can you um, talk about the availability today of archival material in the Reagan presidency and also speculate why you think for someone as consequential as he was um, that historians have not uh, proceeded as quickly to deal with him as they dealt with people 35 years uh, earlier? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for your kind words about my presentation. And let me say this about the data. I wrote a whole book about the Reagan era without once visiting the Reagan Library. Um, it wasn't, you know, I mean, I was interested in doing a synthetic treatment, uh, and uh, there was plenty of knowledge out there. I was just trying to bring it together. Uh, I wasn't interested in new archival discoveries, but this is one indication that there's a lot of information out there. And, you know, there's certainly many researchers who are doing good work at the Reagan Library as well. I think there's no shortage of information. I don't think that's the issue uh, at all. In part, uh, the comparison was unfair um, between how we're dealing with the 1980s now and how people were dealing with the late 40s in the 1980s because, again, the end of World War II and the onset of the Cold War, there were the gripping issues that occupied scholars' minds uh, very rapidly with unusual rapidity, perhaps. Nonetheless, I do think we're still behind schedule. It's not that there aren't a lot of books being written about Reagan. Uh, I don't have a high opinion of a lot of them. I don't think a lot of them are, are really serious scholarship. I do think because in some ways we still live in, I mean, I don't want to, this is not totally true, but in some ways we still live in the Reagan era. I mean, issues in some ways are still framed in, in the way they were framed in the 1980s. And uh, th this means it's very difficult for people to extricate uh, the period from uh, partisan division. And, and I think that it's difficult to, it's a challenge. And to me it was a challenge to write about a period this recent because I think there's a paradox. Uh, on the one hand, it's very important to try to transcend partisanship in one's judgments and interpretations. And I tried to do that, and you know, whether I succeeded, uh, others can decide. But at the same time, paradoxically, Doing that means not being afraid to make judgments in the way that we do about leaders and, and periods of the more remote past. And we talk about you know, Ulysses Grant or Andrew Jackson. Uh, we have no hesitancy about expressing our approval or disapproval or our estimation of the success or failure of their policies or th those policies' coherence or incoherence. But I think there's some hesitation about uh, seeming judgmental about Reagan because 
one anticipates charges of partisan bias. Uh, and that's something that people just have to get over. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't mean that they should be, take a blithe attitude toward it. I, I think they should be serious and, and try to transcend partisanship, but, but they should not be afraid to make considered judgments. Don't. Thank you for your presentation. I'm Don Wolfensberger with the Wilson Center. I'm wondering whether you'd enlighten me a little bit more about the triumph of the nuclear freeze movement. Uh, I was on the staff in Congress at the time, and I.